what, what you got over there? Oh, uh, it's just a uh, castle. Um, you, uh, <laughs> you, you have one too. It's pretty, oh, yeah. pretty yeah. extravagant. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I took that, uh, you know, that reward we got for the rat killer quest, and I invested in a beachfront property, mm -hmm. found a clam, oyster farms, got a lot of pearls, started selling them to diviners. And everything. Was that a flamethrower? Oh yeah, yeah. Some gnomes made it for me. Pretty custom. Um, it's a work in progress. You know what can I say? <laughs> yeah. Got big plans for it. Well, I got some investments coming in later, some dwarves uh, and other planar investments. To be honest, you know, moving away from gold into like souls and soul gems, things like that. Planar futures are where it's at, if you understand me, because you know we can just get like massive amounts of wealth and if you could summon a genie then you just like you don't even need money anymore you all, you all right over there man great great yeah. good yeah. oh yeah I, I see you look at that yeah, wow. you can almost see it over here over your I, I stand wall. up but it's all right yeah it's good yeah so today we're talking about what you spend your gold on in web dm Okay, Jim, now that we got the castle envy out of the way. Yes. Uh, we're here today to talk about what the hell your players are going to spend their gold on. <laughs> right. Because we yeah. get this a lot. Like, you, we do get this one a right? lot, yeah. Yeah, and I see it a lot online just hanging out, and it seems like it's a problem that's maybe unique to 5th edition. Like, earlier editions, you had a money sink that you had to, that you had, your characters had to put their money into, mm -hmm. whether it was like hirelings and strongholds and things like that, or magic items in 3rd and 4th edition D&D, but that's not around in 5th. A common refrain that you'll sometimes hear is like, after plate mail, what is there to spend money on? It's a problem that speaks to kind of the nature of 5th of edition and how the culture of play has maybe evolved and changed and we're doing more like action fantasy, it, it's saving the world, it's like high paced and, and sort of like, <laughs> what are you gonna do? You're gonna go to your day job and craft something when the world is at threat and you're the only one who can save it? On the one hand, the, the, the kind of games that we've seen from Wizards of the Coast have this urgency to them that doesn't suggest that you're gonna be like counting coins and doing a lot of accounting type work uh, in your adventures. But at the same time, it's like, then why have it there in the first place? So if gold's gonna be a part of the fantasy worlds that you're in and it's gonna be a reward for the adventures that you go on, then there should be something to spend it on and something to you know invest in and, and to add to your character in the world. I think it's a problem that, that people face and mm -hmm. I think it's worth a, worth a chat. <laughs> okay, so where should we start? Uh, maybe in the PHB? Yes. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, they have a few things to say about how you live and, and what to spend it on. Absolutely, yeah. And it's the same kind of a, a level of abstraction that we see in a lot of other sort of systems in 5th edition, where the living expenses fold in all kinds of things. And, and really, you would want to work with your DM or, or have the DM just sort of describe to you, like, what is it that's actually covered in the living expenses? And, mm -hmm. and how does it differ from, say, the descriptions that are in the player's handbook for, like, what's actually particular to your game? I keep coming back to the living expenses expenses because when I look at like, okay, what would you spend your money on regularly? This is it. If you don't have a lot of downtime, if you don't have like a home base that you go to mm -hmm. or like a home city or something that your characters or your campaign revolves around, then it can be harder to do living expenses. We'll get to the downtime stuff later. It's one of those things where I, I feel like having done WebDM for a while, you know, for as long as we have now and all the questions that we get, there's like a category of questions that's basically like, there are rules in this game that you're just not using. There is a problem. You're handing out treasure and you've got all this gold. The players have all this money that they could spend it on, but it's just like sitting there in bags and chests and extra dimensional spaces. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're buying some healing potions with it or something. Maybe they all have <laughs> backgrounds that give them free room and board. Well, I was going to, I was going to say, I was just about to ask, like, Save some if, money. If, if everybody's got their backgrounds covered, then why have living expenses even? Why well, I have mean, like, living expenses <laughs> or like the fact that all it takes is proficiency in the performance skill to maintain a wealthy lifestyle, which is just kind of like, that seems really with within reach of a lot of people. Why aren't more people learning to play instruments? You gotta have Bard's Row down by in front of the keep, you know, where you got drums here and whatever there, and yeah, just yeah. the sounds of 20 <laughs> different musical instruments playing. Right. It's abstracted, right? And I think like trying to nitpick at the details of living expenses, the fact that according to the rules, you, you select a level of living expense that you want to live at at the beginning of the month. So there's nothing stopping you from going from squalid, going on an adventure and like, now I'm gonna live a wealthy lifestyle 
uh, mm -hmm. for as long as that'll last me. And to me, I think that's weird because it suggests a degree of mobility in the uh, in the D and D world that's like not necessarily there in the mm -hmm. inspirational source material or certainly the historical source material. It seems weird to me in that sense. It's one of those things where like maybe one month you're going out to eat and you're going to movies and stuff, mm -hmm. and this isn't from personal experience or anything. <laughs> and then one month you're like, I need to save money. So maybe I'm just going to eat ramen and cereal and stay home and watch Netflix. Sure, right? sure. I'm choosing to not spend that much versus yeah. spending more. This sort of points to the fact that D&D, &D, especially as it's described in like modern editions, isn't, it's got the trappings of medievalism about it, mm -hmm. but it is not medieval at all. So living expenses is where I'd start. And this is where, if, if you look at it, you can see that there's close correlations to how much, say, skilled and unskilled laborers earn. So like, for instance, if you're looking in the player's handbook, an, an unskilled laborer earns two silver pieces a day, which you can see corresponds exactly to a poor lifestyle. And we might expect that to see, right? This is someone that doesn't have any proficiencies that they're using to help with their job. Perhaps they're like a farm hand mm -hmm. or like a Steve door or some other kind of dock worker. Rock like, breaker in a quarry. Right, rock breaker. There are some terrible jobs in medieval times. Dung flinger. I was going to say dung collector. Someone who <laughs> collects the town's poop and, well, and you gotta disposes it. of it. The person that collects the pee for the tanners, that's another job. Yeah. Uh, the person that cleans out the latrines, that's another. Like Those are all jobs that people had and were professions in uh, times past that correspond to maybe that level of lifestyle. That sort of poor or squalid and they're earning, you know, probably they're probably playing like <laughs> clipped copper coins or okay. or like script or something you know they don't even get actual uh, money it's a good starting point because the dungeon master and the player can work and go like okay here's what living here's what my living expenses mean perhaps it's different for different cultures different cities different places in the world the conditions and sort of standards change and you can adjust the cost per day of living expenses to reflect different things about your campaign world maybe um, the country is at war or something like that. And you say, okay, everybody, you know, your living expenses are, you know, you add 50% to them to reflect the added taxes, the fact that there's scarcity in certain goods that you could acquire at markets, mm -hmm. the fact that there's this and that, all of these sort of hassles that you would have to go through, that's extracted in just a gold piece price. And we're not looking at like modeling markets and having a functioning economy. We're just looking at like, this is a, convenient game mechanic for your players to interact with that gets rid of some of their money. It gives them a sense of accomplishment, you know? If you start out at like a poor or a modest lifestyle and you're able to work your way up to wealthy or aristocratic, then that is another way that you can show the players like, hey, they've gained influence and notoriety in the world mm -hmm. is apart from like level and reputation all that stuff. Yeah, I was gonna say outside of just experience and ability, it's the role playing side of it. You should have some influence after a while. I mean, if you're the people that took down a dragon. Right. People are gonna be like, oh no, them? They yeah. took down a dragon. They took down a dragon, That's yeah. That's why they're walking around with, with their sacks all hanging out. <laughs> it's just gold laden. <laughs> These gigantic fantasy coins that are in DD that are just bigger than poker chips and weigh a tenth of a pound. That's one way of doing it. And I think like if you're not running that kind of game where there's a lot of downtime and your characters are rooted in one spot for a while, then like you might not feel like living expenses are offering much to you for your game. But if you're like, say, running Waterdeep now, right? You know, Mad Mage or working through Dragon Heist, then like they probably have an apartment somewhere in town or, or yeah. rent a room somewhere. Maybe they're working their way up to buy some property. Uh, I know that uh, Dragon Heist has a tavern that you can acquire somehow. And you know, that's sort of like a way to offset some of your living expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, although uh, obviously you have to pay for upkeep and things like that. You pay those employees, you gotta pay for 401k, <laughs> matches, Stuff. dental. Yep, yep, uh, gotta have a competent HR department. It's a good starting place because you can modify things and there's a lot of like really cool implications that come out of lifestyle. And I think coupled with downtime activities, they go really well together. And as Xanathar's guide points out to us, if you find that your players have a lot of money, then downtime activities coupled with living expenses are a great way to take care of some of that. I'm sure the DMG kind of uh, expands on that. Maybe a few other things and things that were in like past edition. You know, you got, maybe you get a keep. You know, maybe you've got to have a keep. But there's still room in modern D&D for that model of play where you get to a certain level and your character becomes like tied to the world a bit. If we're talking about high fantasy superhero action, you got to build Avengers Tower eventually. <laughs> you right? do have to eventually build it, yeah. yeah. It represents character change. And like we said with living expenses, we're like climbing up that ladder and showing the players like this is how far their characters have come in the world. Mm -hmm. Having a stronghold, having property, having something that roots them in the game world uh, and the society 
of that game world more strongly is a way to reflect that as well. Older editions of D&D, you'd get to a certain level, say a fighter would. You're either, uh, you know, either allowed to go like clear out a hex and, and get rid of all the baddies on it and then build a tower and hopefully that attracts, or a fortress or something, hopefully that attracts people who will come live there and you can start collecting taxes. But if you're going with, say, a more structured kind of game world or something, you could acquire property from a monarch or religious organization. You could require, or you could acquire it from a guild or as a reward for something. Maybe there's just like an abandoned structure or something you can take over. Lots of those in D&D. &D. Yeah, it's full of ghosts and <laughs> goblins, but you yeah. know, hey, go if clear. You, yeah, if you exercise it and clear them out, why not? It's another way to have the players uh, spend some money uh, that their characters have acquired and to root them in the game world and yet another avenue for the dungeon master to work to complicate things, introduce new elements to their campaign and, and uh, the like. The table that's in the dungeon master's guide, which I think is right before the downtime activity section, is pretty bare bones. It'll tell you like, how much a structure costs overall, and then like how much it costs to upkeep, including like staffing it and everything. But it's not like older editions where it's like, here's how much a tower costs, and then this section of wall is worth this many gold pieces, and then this gatehouse is worth that. Yeah. Just kind of buy it wholesale. Yeah. Not worry about the details too much. Yeah, it's not it's not like old modular. Now it's just you buy the whole mobile home. Can't <laughs> add on the library wing. <laughs> not necessarily. Um, how often should a DM try to steal their player's money? Because I mean, if they're going around flashing cash everywhere, there's yeah. a thieves guild around they're yes. going to notice this and uh, it's not that i'm saying this for personal experience and that my players have like eight grand that they've had forever <laughs> and i've been like i need to steal that just so because they've just kind of gotten complacent with it they literally just like they're like yeah we're not going to touch it it's just like our savings that we don't have to worry about the ship's upkeep and all that uh -huh. we can just kind of bypass their it. operating budget but think about this for a minute like Gold is a physical object. It's not like fiat currency. It's not like, you know, the number that's in your bank account that you only see on, you know, your mobile app. It's a coin that you have to hold in your hand. If you pay for something for it, the person that you give it to has to put it somewhere. They've got probably have a lockbox. They might have someone guard, <laughs> helping them guard it. It's kind of one of those things where you don't really think about it and it's just like a number on your character sheet. And because most people don't seem to use encumbrance, it, it never really comes up. But if they're walking around with thousands and thousands of gold pieces. It represents a significant amount of wealth if you look at just like how much the average person earns in Dungeons and Dragons, which is like two gold pieces a day, either <laughs> two silver or two gold pieces a day. One of those, you know, somewhere between there. Thousands of gold pieces is a tremendous amount of money for in almost anywhere they go. That's a target for monarchs, for thieves, for religious authority figures, for guild masters. Everybody's gonna want a cut of that. Are you trying to get through this gate? Well, there's a tax on this one. Mm. You know, oh, you don't have the right license? Here's another tax. You can take it legit, like through more, I guess, legitimate means, otherwise known as taxation. Tax is theft. Illegitimate means, which is called theft. It's still the same, right? Yeah. And players, I think they'll be more likely to accept sort of like, this is the world they live in, their costs sort of operating in this world versus like, oh yeah, you woke up and someone teleported into your bedroom and took all your money and, and now it's it's gone. Even then, it's still a physical object. You could go get it back. It's not like it's been stolen and you're, they'll never see it again. Yeah, that amount of money could be, I mean, not even 8,000 gold, but just like thousands of gold pieces could be a real, well, it could be a real problem. <laughs> yeah, I only went after it the, like initially when they were flashing it around the first time. Yeah. Had some pirates go after it. But, but since then, I've been like laying off because I'm like, we'll give it another adventure before yeah. it's, it's it'll be that adventure where they're going to be like, E404 is going to be like, where it all go? Where, where's all my gold? Just thinking a minute about the coins themselves and sort of like carrying them around. The you know the characters they're in, they're you know going shopping or something like that. And someone reaches into the bag of holding and pulls out you know more coins than it could possibly hold. That's probably going to get around. It more than likely will get around, eventually get around to someone who can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And if they have any kind of like temporal authority or or something like that, then they will tr probably try to leverage that. Wars are really expensive. And in our own history, monarchs say debasing coins or, or trying to find ways to get more money without having access to a gold mine or a silver mine fuels a lot of problems. And, and it's a real limitation to pre-modern societies. And the fact that in D&D, people just walk around <laughs> with tons and tons of gold. I think there's ways to play with that and ways to make it both an asset and a, a sort of a, a burden for the uh, for the party. Low money, more problems. It's a common refrain for a reason. <laughs> How does a DM give the players, or at least like, 
encourage them to explore new ventures. You can attach incentives to it in the sense of like, yeah, if you maintain, say, a, a comfortable, wealthy, or aristocratic lifestyle, you know, if you are trying to get in good with the aristocracy or whoever it is that rules this place, yeah, being anything less than wealthy is just not going to even get you in the door. You need to be able to both maintain this for a long enough time to build a reputation that this is who you are now. Yeah, no one really knows where you came from, but you, know, you paid that uh, charlatan some money to forge some documents for you and pull a little knight's tale and... <laughs> <laughs> you know? just about to say. <laughs> and pass yourself off as someone that you're not. The D&D world is, is, has a social mobility to it that medieval societies don't have. And I think that that makes for a better gameplay, but it also means that there's room for uh, you know, people to pass themselves off as something that they're not, or oh, yeah. to remake themselves yeah. uh, in some way. The intersection of your character's reputation, their wealth, and their background is a great way to model what their position in society is, who they have ready access access to in society and how those people will treat them. Your characters might be like, yeah, you know what? One silver piece a day for squalid. Don't even worry about that. I'm going to be, I'll just do that. Saving a lot of money. Well, maybe you're subjected to different kinds of crime for that. And, and if you walk around and you still have a lot of material objects that are worth a lot, but you maintain a squalid lifestyle, then maybe your neighbor's going to be like, what are you doing with all that arms and armor and magic items over here? Like, are you holding out on us? Those are the kinds of things that you might do if, if they're trying to <laughs> save some money or, or live on the cheap side. Maybe you give them disadvantage on any save versus poison or disease because they just live in terrible conditions and they're malnourished and they might be adventurers, but they're not taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Or maybe the opposite. If they maintain a comfortable or wealthy lifestyle, they have advantage on those kinds of things because they're able to eat well and sleep well and, and have a, a safe place to, to stay. A little harder to like maybe uh, get exhaustion, kind of like the Adventures of Middle Earth when you disembark, you, you're in a great place. Yes. You know, you're yeah. healthy, you're, you're hearty, you got your rations and uh, yeah, you're yeah. ready to go out and do it. It could be that certain downtime activities are unavailable to you if you maintain a certain lifestyle. If you're wretched, how in the world are you going to be buying magic items? If you you make the leap from squalid to whatever, that's going to start raising a lot of eyebrows. Go from, you know, he he's spends his copper on a bowl of gruel mm -hmm. one week, and then the next week he's eating steak and potatoes across the street at, at, at whatever. People will People talk. are going to start talking. People will Maybe, talk. And then that's when that's when the thieves' guilds start to get wind of that. Right, They'll start right, following right. you around. Yeah, how did, where did you get all that money from? Why, how did this happen? You know, if it's enough money, then whoever has the power to leverage, <laughs> you know, social pressure will attempt to use that against the party. So if you've got a bunch of characters and they've got a a lot of money or if you have a party that has a lot of money that's just lying around these are the different ways like building up the non action non combat elements of your campaign if that's what everybody wants is a way to kind of work that in because now say for instance you know it's like 200 gold 250 gold pieces and as many days 250 days to learn a new language every downtime is like ah, 250 gold and uh, you know it's 500 total because you have to spend a gold piece a day for that plus living expenses and yeah. then yeah yeah now i know a bunch of languages i mean i know that we used to do that in our back in our second edition days it yeah. was one of those things that everybody would be like what language do you speak okay uh, we're going on this adventure all right well he's going to be teaching me this i'm teaching them this yeah and we tell the dm this is what we're doing yeah and then after an appropriate amount of time, yes. he would tell us like, all right, take this gold off. Everybody should be doing that all the time. That's sort of like a tangent that I was thinking about is like, what are sort of the downtime activities that you could have for traveling? You could add back in magic item sales and they are downtime activities, right? There's rules for them. And I believe both the DMG and Xanathar's guide because there's not like an official magic item economy. If you don't have like a magic shop style game world, then, as I know we've mentioned before, then maybe buying and selling a magic item is more like the market for fine art, where it, it's au private auctions. It, you need yeah. to know somebody first, which means you need to maintain a certain lifestyle mm -hmm. to be able to know them. You have to have a good reputation, because ultimately gold doesn't matter at the highest levels of D&D, because it can just be conjured out of thin air. Your reputation is really what matters. Who you are, uh, are you trustworthy, are you, you know, do you follow through with what you say mm -hmm. you're going to do? Interestingly enough, at the lowest levels of the D&D economies, that's what matters most. When you have nothing, how trustworthy you are when you have everything. Yeah, and if your characters have a lot of money and they're not spending it and people know about it, and it could say, you know, change their the village's life or the guild's life or whatever it is, then they might get that kind of reputation for being miserly or not generous with their wealth. And if you're trying to emulate a certain historical period, for a, long, a large part of, say, medieval history or even ancient history, spending money 
as an aristocrat was how you proved you were aristocrat. It's like you maintain that lifestyle. You, mm -hmm. okay, you're coming over to my house, I'm gonna give you the biggest feast you can find. I'm gonna give you gifts, right? The ability to have a surplus that you can then bestow gifts upon other people was sort of like a prerequisite for say being a Frankish king or something like that. Yeah. Ring giver is a, you know, a moniker that, that comes out of that time period. You, you have rings to give and you have so many of them that you don't wanna just keep them for yourself. That's a similar sort of attitude of maybe the adventure Adventurers come through town and they throw themselves a parade, and it's just like raining silver pieces, like the Joker and that the and, Birds, and Bat Birds, Birds, Birds Batman. Batman. Nowadays, what that is is people buy libraries at, at universities, the so and so sports center. Been doing that for hundreds, thousands of years, and yeah. and you maybe your adventurers are doing the same thing. It's a it might be a vanity project. That is a big thing though for PCs. Yeah. You, you got to have those vanity projects. You do need. Vanity I mean, projects. after you've already conquered the the giants of whatever mountains, then you want to put a Mount Rushmore up there of the yes. party yes. to show who brought these giants low. Yeah, you need to hire like a whole phalanx of dwarven masons to go just like turn that mountainside into a profile picture of you. <laughs> just let everybody know. How would you carve out the moon? Be like, if you wanted your face carved on the moon in D and D, you would summon Earth elementals from the planet, uh -huh. and you would have a diviner yeah. looking at it and and giving instruction to uh -huh. the summoner uh -huh. through his telescope. Yes. Like, all right, in this quadrant, blah blah blah. Okay, now move here. No, the nose needs to be smaller. No, no, too small. Uh -huh. Shit. All right, wall of stone. Yeah, wall of stone. Bring it back up. <laughs> hold it back up. The vanity projects are really fun, and and like you're saying, like sort of civic institutions are, are one way to sort of invest in that. Yeah, I'm a high level adventurer. I'm I'm ninth or tenth or even eleventh level which for most people that's pretty high level I show my influence I show my whatever I'm a, I'm a fighter I'm gonna open a dueling school like a fencing Academy or yeah. something like that or I am a wizard and I believe that you know this the fact that anyone can learn this these spells and change their life I'm gonna open up a self-help Academy where our trained staff of magical tutors will give you everything you need to make you wealthier and wise or something like that wouldn't that be a spell help Academy spell help Academy yes yeah. at some point it's like you're limited by your imagination and right. yeah the equipment Equipment tables in, in the player's handbook, there's not a lot of them. You're not going to be able to spend a lot of money to increase your character's personal power level the way you could in third and fourth edition. But I like that mm -hmm. because there was a, a point at which if you were playing one of either of those editions and you were not spending your money on magic items to acquire them, and that's how we ran it. Like I don't think we ever bought or made magic items in third. I'm remembering a couple of items that we had made. I think it was a sword or a suit of armor or something like that, but for the most part, it was we sought out the item through a third party and right. then would purchase it. A genuine critique of third edition that said, if you weren't spending your gold on that, then you would fall behind. The game assumed that you were spending your gold on magic items, which meant that you would fight X number of monsters at X level and whatever, consume a Y number of resources. And if you didn't do that, if you wanted to spend your money on vanity projects, then you would have to accept that, yeah, I'm not gonna have the, the gear that I would need to compete. So decoupling money from personal uh, character power, I think is a good thing because it frees you up to be like, listen, my character has a class, they've got abilities, all that stuff. That's their primary sort of driver for their personal power. Their money is how they interact with the rest of the world. And if they've got enough money to sponsor a feast hall for the guilds of a city, or you know, upgrade the walls of a town because we've listened, we helped you defend the, you know, the attack of the Ogre Empire, and now we'll help you rebuild. They've got those kind of resources then at some point, like, you can either uh, have that fold in sort of their reputation or whatever, or it can create problems for them as the legitimate authority might be resentful of the adventurers coming in and doing all this stuff. Yeah, when you start taking the power away from those that are supposed to handle the defense and the upkeep of a, a village or a town, Yeah. I mean, that might be a move as like a backdoor coup. Like you're just sure. trying to win over the people first, mm -hmm. and you move it up one town at a time until you get to the big old capital city. Yes. And it's like, why aren't we in charge? Yeah, why aren't we in charge? And you're like, look at something like, say, Republican Rome, where in order to climb up the ranks of the Corsus Honorum, the sort of like ladder of offices that you would rise through, and they all had different property requirements, age requirements, and the like. But in order to do that, in order to get your name recognized, you'd often have to spend tremendous amounts of money throwing games. Basically, like, I'm gonna feed everybody in the city for a day. And they would bring out like big tables and they would go through neighborhoods and it would, and it would be known that like, so-and-so patrician or senator or whoever bought you this meal. Like you are eating this bread, drinking this wine, having this food because of this person. Later on, you're gonna go watch some gladiator games because of this person. Yeah. You're going to go in this building, which was built by this other person. And so like, 
your personal reputation was at stake in these. It was all tied up in how much money you had and how willing you were to spend it. No, now I want to make a character, probably like a centaur, who like opens a racing track. Because I was like, <laughs> oh, a casino would be fun, but gambling in another way, like you'd need a griffin racing track or like some kind of crazy D&D thing. That would be really fun. And, and you know, so gambling that's based on that and taking bets down at the Hippogriff track gonna be a, uh, a great way to, to burn through some of your money. And I think there's a carousing table in Xanathar's Guide that you could probably modify for something like that. Fifth edition's heroic action works best as sort of a mission-based approach. Why are we even tracking gold pieces at all? We're not getting XP for gold. What's the narrative purpose of spending money and acquiring it if it's like this is a quest for to save the world? D&D &D pretty much being made in America, I think it's just the the vestigial leftover effect of oh, being born in a capitalist economy. <laughs> certainly, And, yeah. you know, you have to reinforce that because it's what we know, right? Number one, I do think you're right on that. But I, I would call on DMs who have this problem, like, what do my players spend their money on? If you're not running a game that's it's about, say, the day-to-day -day survival of a bunch of grungy murder hobos. It's not like sort of a, the Lankmarian, gritty swords and sorcery world where how much money you have and what you can afford and, and who you know is, is a big deal. It's about the action. It's about the heroism. It, it, it's, it's not about the gritty details. It's about the broad strokes. Then just like abstract your money to the point where you just don't even uh, worry about it. And this is how I've played largely for the last couple of years, where mm -hmm. I don't usually hand out money as loot uh, in the D&D &D games that I run, largely because Land Between Two Rivers doesn't really have money. <laughs> They've got bits. They've Sometimes got they bits. get some really good teeth. Sometimes they get some really good teeth. Yes. Like no cavities or anything. <laughs> no cavities or anything. Even some dragon teeth. Like magic items are, are loot. Reputation is. Uh, access to things uh, are, are part of that loot. If I was going to run something like whatever the latest module is or something like that, I might not track money. And I might instead come up with something that lets me abstract it and is inspired by games like certain White Wolf games or mm -hmm. Call of Cthulhu or Marvel Face Rip where... Yeah, where you have like a wealth score. Yeah. So instead of like having individual gold pieces, you say, make a wealth save whenever you try to purchase something significant. And you get a modifier that's based on your relative wealth score. We just looted the Dragon's Horde, so we get like a plus 10 to our wealth save. Depending on how you do on the save, you either don't subtract the modifier or maybe the purchase is big enough that like, yeah, we had 10, now it's plus nine. And you just sort of abstract it that way and then major purchases like castles, boats, horses, things that cost a lot of money that wouldn't be covered by just by like your living expenses are represented by that wealth save. And then your living expenses are just sort of abstracted away even more. Yeah, if you have the time to practice a profession or do a thing, then you have a place to sleep, you have food to eat, that sort of thing. And I think that that might make for a more engaging experience for DMs because then they're they're not having to worry about this thing. You, you can see that there's just a lot of angst about it, a lot of anxiety, like, how do I do this? What do I do with my money? What do I do with the player's money? They have too much, they have too little. How much should they have at this level? How much should they not? It seems like that really gets to a lot of DMs and just like, why are you even worrying about it at all? This is a game about fighting monsters and casting spells and saving people and doing heroic things and not counting coins. So they, that's an option is to just say, no, thank you. We're not going to worry about it. Yeah, I think that's how uh, Robert Baratheon would handle it. <laughs> well, no, he hated counting coppers. Well, I sure he did. I you know, figures, but the Iron Bank doesn't. They, yeah, they the are, Iron Bank is going to get their gold. <laughs> grungy murder <laughs> transients. <laughs> Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. Want to see us play? We've got games every week on Twitch, which we upload to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. If you like the video, hit that subscribe button, click the bell, give us a thumbs up, and tell us in the comments. Thanks for watching. I just like hanging out and being a gray name NPC. I don't have any quest info. We don't have a card for the game that's going on here. So I like three or four people come up and ask us if we have a clue. We don't have a clue. We're just the background. It's like, if this is the starting level of an MMO, then we're like the background NPC that's just like commoner, level one, priest, CR one half. You know, like that. That's where we don't have a name. We just have a, at best, we've got random personality traits from the table in the DMG. If the DM remembered to roll them, probably didn't. They're just going to make something up off the top of their head. It'll be the same as the last 
NPC, they made it the top of their head. And if you want a cookie, they are available. <laughs> right? Yeah, I made snicker uh, That's one of my big things. Uh, they're very good. Yeah, I mean, but no, no offense if you don't want one. I understand. You have a you have a temple to maintain. So. I work that hard enough. <laughs>